reviewing the political culture of the Austrian school is important for two reasons. First, it shows what kind of world the Austrians were trying to create when they devised their methodology. Second, it shows what kind of political opinions are engendered by applying their methodology to various issues. There is probably a chicken and egg effect here, as political views inform theory, and theory informs political views. At any rate, it is useful to know the intended consequences of Austrian policies. Austrian professor David Prychiko describes the political culture of his movement's best, policy-wise, Austrians, as a group tend to be political conserves, although there are one or two of us, including yours truly, who question its strictly conservative ideology. And, like all other schools of thought, Austrians have their share of cranks, crackpots, and weirdos, who are best left ignored. Prychiko would appear to be one of the more reasonable members of the Austrian school. But for the most part, the Austrian school has been remarkably hostile toward women, minorities, workers and the environment. Lillian Rockwell, the president of the Mises Institute, writes, Environmental regulation has been among the worst offenders in recent years. Nobody can calculate the extraordinary losses associated with the Clean Air Act or the absurdities associated with wetlands or endangered species policies. One presumes the extraordinary losses evoked in the above quote refer to corporate profits. Regardless, it's worth noting that in the hundred years before the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, the environment grew increasingly polluted. In the two decades, since, it has grown cleaner. Rockwell's claim is simply an historical. Some of Rockwell's attacks on liberal constituencies are equally mindless. Civil rights legislation is the worst regulatory intervention in labor markets. The worst? Affirmative action doesn't even exist in the private sector, only in the public sector, or for public contractors. It is curious that Rockwell would single out a racial issue as the prime example of government meddling in the labor market, especially, since private labor markets are infinitely more affected by the minimum wage, overtime pay, workers' compensation or OSHA safety regulations. But perhaps Rockwell isn't even referring to affirmative action, when he mentions civil rights legislation, Perhaps he is alluding to the Civil Rights Act and other legislation that ended Jim Crow laws. Rockwell also defended the Los Angeles Police Department after its brutal beating of Rodney King was caught on videotape. His public comments drew mixed reactions from the right-wing libertarian community. The editor of Liberty heatedly criticized him, but other noted right-wing libertarians, like Murray Rothbard, publicly defended him. The foundational Austrian works, when they wander away from economics and start commenting on social issues, are filled with much intentional humor. Ludwig von Mises' views on sex and gender equality were aimed at Gallic even for his time. Before the advent of capitalism, Mises believed men and women lived by the law of the jungle. Primitive man was greedy and horny, and took defenseless primitive woman like an object without any will of its own. Only the rise of capitalism brought monogamy into this world, because the capitalist way of thinking and calculation gave rise to ordered relationships. As late as 1925 he saw no need for giving women the right to vote, since motherhood is the highest state of female happiness. He also saw no need to give women equal rights, since a woman is simply the lover and mother who serves the sexual drive. Mises' views of race are similarly enlightened, it is perfectly legitimate to assume that the races are different in their cognitive abilities and in their willpower and accordingly are unequally suited for the task of setting up societies, and that the better races are characterized in particular by their special ability to strengthen social bonds. Mises also had high praise for British colonialism, which he felt benefited all its subjugated peoples, and, indeed, the entire world. As for workers and everyday people, Mises had nothing but contempt for them. He wrote, the masses do not think. This is precisely the reason why they follow those who do think. The intellectual leadership of mankind is a position held by the very few who are able to think. And who are the thinkers? Entrepreneurs, of course. Another important Austrian is Murray Rothbard, whose writings advocating liberty and peace often master hostility and prejudice toward the less fortunate. He believed that society is filled with ineducable masses who, through public school, are being dragooned into an institution for which they have little interest or aptitude. Rothbard is a little vague on what these ineducable masses might be suitable for, perhaps cheap and exploitable labor? And all the more exploitable, lacking the education needed to understand and combat their plight. 
Rothbard does not attribute the problems of blacks or other minorities to racism and prejudice, but to those very parasitic values of idleness and irresponsibility found in those communities. Rothbard's philosophies are especially harsh against children, stemming from a formulaic application of property rights dogma to the whole subject. His arguments favoring abortion are ones that most pro-choice advocates would reject out of hand. Rothbard viewed the fetus as an invader of the mother's property. What the mother is doing in abortion is causing an unwanted entity within her body to be ejected from it. If the fetus dies, this does not rebut the point that no being has a right to live, unbidden, as a parasite within or upon some person's body. Once the child is born, it cannot be killed or maimed, but otherwise it is the absolute property of its parents. They can do whatever they please with it, even sell it on a flourishing free child market. Nor does age bring any additional rights to the child, as long as it lives with its parents. In fact, parents have no obligation or responsibility to the child in any way, they are entirely within their rights to let it starve to death. Rothbard further argues that no authority should force them to feed, clothe, shelter or care for the child in any way, for to do so would be a violation of the parents' rights. On several issues, Austrians, like right-wing libertarians in general, do favor leftist policies. For example, they generally oppose censorship, war, and drug prohibition. Indeed, right-wing libertarians pride themselves with being socially liberal but economically conservative. Unfortunately, the social views often get short shrift. The Cato Institute, for example, learned long ago to highlight its economic beliefs, while ignoring any parallel social philosophies. Likewise, Austrian politics flow from their economic beliefs that the forces of competition should be completely unleashed, and whatever the losers get is what they deserve. Rothbard candidly admits that the rightist libertarian is not opposed to inequality. He also admits, in contrast to such utopians as Marxists, rightist libertarians do not assume that the ushering in of the purely free society of their dreams will also bring with it a new, magically transformed libertarian man. We do not assume that the line will lie down with the lamb, or that no one will have criminal or fraudulent designs upon his neighbor. How Austrians propose to sell such a dual vision to the nation is a good question. Perhaps they are counting on the inadequable masses to accept a hopelessly one-sided deal. To defeat the Austrian school's proposal, all liberals need to do is publicize the Habesian nature of it as much as possible, 